So welcome everybody. It's Saturday, June first, Sabbath day, and we're doing a uh, two-part presentation today. The first one is on seven undeniable proofs that man has no authority to change the seven-day Sabbath observance. In the second part, we'll be talking more about um, about why to observe the Sabbath. This part is why you can't you know, change the Sabbath. It's a pretty deep dive, but um, hopefully we'll have some chance for discussion at the end of this stuff again as well. But let's get started. So days of observation in general. So we have, for example, in the United States, Independence Day, known as the 4th of July, and it's a federal holiday, and it um, celebrates the Declaration of Independence which was ratified by the Second Congress 248 years ago on July 4th, 1776, establishing the United States of America. So there's a declaration, is there something of a specific date? Is there a memorial to that date? And so that's the day of observation, the ways of observation. So Independence Day is commonly associated with fireworks, parades, barbecues, carnivals, Fairs, picnics, concerts, baseball games, family reunions, speeches, ceremonies, and other public. That makes sense because, of course, it's celebrating the um, the, the initiation of the United States, the, the Declaration of Independence. So, who has the authority to? to make days of observation around the world. It's, it's the reigning power, it could be a, a king or government. In the US, that's delegated to Congress. And right as of today, they're start off with four, but as of today, there's 11 federal holidays that are designated by the United States Congress. Each one has its own significance. Each one is a certain day, a certain way of observation. It memorializes something and it was authorized or that day to be observed by the by the Congress. And obviously, the observation is highest amongst those in personal agreement with its uh, significance. <clears throat> so, for example, some days, one of the days, one of the uh, eleven days, is Christmas. So, uh, it doesn't mean that people have to observe Christmas on the twenty fifth, but it means that there's a holiday on the twenty fifth that everybody's uh, able to take advantage of. But those that observe those days are the ones that, that um, are going to be most in agreement with the significance of that day. So Declaration of Independence was 248 years ago. Over 6,000 years ago, a covenant was proclaimed from heaven. And this covenant is found in Genesis 1, 26, 27. It says, and God said, and I want to, I've highlighted a few things um, because it's it's God speaking singularly. You notice a lot of plurals in here. So, for example, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, even though it says man, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female created he them. And this, this is the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. So it's Genesis, it gives us the very first glimpse of things. As we go through the rest of the Bible, these revelations become clearer and clearer and clearer. But basically, it's saying God, but it says, let us. Well, what does that mean? Well, God, there's one God, one one type of God, one nature of God. But God exists in more than one personality. For example, the Father and the Son. So God said, let us. So God, we have God the Father, God the Son. But the same thing, he created man in the same way. So you have man 
which we have man as one nature, one kind, but existing in male and female, for example. So it's when something is in the image of something, it's kind of the outward appearance of, 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 uh, of an object. So, so, and someone in the likeness of is more of an inward. So you could say she has a striking resemblance likeness to her father. So even though outwardly she may not look like her father, but there's a likeness in her to her father. So image and likeness are two different words. In the image of God, they're, they're made um, to be one nature, but more than one in, in, in person. And it doesn't take away one from the other. And this is the, 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 the covenant. God saying, I'm going to create man in our image, in the image of God. And in that image and in that likeness, I'm going to give man dominion over all my creation. And one of the biggest errors in all the theology is to try and teach the relationship between God and man in terms of a contract, like an ordinary contract. Because that's 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 the foundation of all kinds of error. Contracts originated in Babylon. Covenant originates in, in the Bible. It's so important to the Bible that the whole, you have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, or the Old Testament, the New Testament. The whole book is about the covenant. You don't have the old contract and the new contract. A contract is transactional. It's just once it's, it, it terminates, once it's fulfilled, then it's done. And you need a new contract. A covenant is ongoing. It's perpetual. It's everlasting. It's transformational. It, it's, it's a good, the best example to use is a, is a wedding, covenant relationship of, of a marriage. So it's not a five-year marriage with a fixed term. It's meant to be ongoing, everlasting. It's meant to be transformational by being what used to be I is now we. What was mine is now ours. What's, and the, the two are now one. Two, two individuals, but one in spirit, one in a court. The same as the father and son are one uh, in spirit, one in, one in, one in likeness. With a contract, it's mandatory to have considerations. Consideration is some form of payment, usually cash, but it can be services. But so with a contract, there's mandatory consideration. With a covenant, there's consideration is not required. So, for example, even when you go to the wedding, the Eastern uh, thing of, of paying dowries or paying money, it's not part of recognized in, in a covenant marriage. In, in the West, you don't you don't pay for that. It's it's a there's no consideration. The in a contract, um, it terminates upon default. So if one party doesn't uphold their end in a contract, then that's terms for default that terminates the contract. In a covenant, the stronger is obliged to help the weaker. So that's why you have in the wedding vows, in better uh, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. It's it's a covenant relationship. It's it's you're you're there as long as the other person wants to remain in the covenant, you're obliged to help them fulfill it. If they if they get some somehow weaker or some way that they're having a hard time to fulfill it, a covenant you're obliged to try and help them fulfill the covenant as long as they want to remain in the covenant. Contract is an exchange of values, so I'm going to give you this to get that. And covenant is it's a union. You're not exchanging things. You're 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 you're, you're sharing something. Co contracts are signed. Covenants are sealed. Contracts focus on the letter of the law. Covenant is the spirit of the law. So there's some general definitions, but we have a covenant here that's that's stated in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. The second chapter of the Bible, we observe the seventh day Sabbath is the fulfillment of the Lord's covenant. Because although man was created the sixth day, the, num the, the Sabbath is the seventh day, because the seventh day is the first day that that covenant is fulfilled. It's the first day that the man and the woman walking together as one 
in peace and harmony with God. And when it talks about the Sabbath, it says it's sanctified too, which means made holy, which means without sin. So that first day that you know Adam and Eve were created, the very next day, God uh, declared the Sabbath. It's the first day they walk together without sin, in harmony, with at peace with God. So the sixth day is, you know, that's why the number of man is six, but the number of God is seven, and it's always the, the fulfillment. It's the seventh, it's the fulfillment of the covenant. So the, there was a, a historic seventh day and on that seventh day, man, uh, walk, which was in, in the form of the male and female, walked together with God. And that was memorialized. So it's a historic day. But that's the whole population of the world at the time. There's only two people. And the seed of the whole population of the world was in their loins, the man and the woman. So, so the whole future generations, and of course, the covenant was given to for them to multi multiply and, and and fill the earth. So this day was the whole population of the world walking without sin with God. And it's this triumph that God comes out and says, this is the Sabbath. I've ceased my work. My work is completed. It's a, And this is what it's all about. All of creation was about this, this day, about walking together with this covenant people. <clears throat> we get to chapter two, so now we've only got the first chapter, and this is where the, the, the Sabbath is in, in chapter two. But right after the introduction of the Sabbath, it says, these are the generations of the heavens and earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So in chapter one, you have Elohim, which is God. Here you have personal name for God, the personal representative. That's Lord God. But to begin with, we look at what, what does it mean by generations? That's the English translation from Hebrew term, Toledoth, which means an orderly process, and then made, which uh, means fully completed. So it's saying that there was an orderly, uh, orderly process beginning with the first day, let there be light, all the way through to the creation of man. And then at the creation of man, they, um, uh, the work was, was declared completed. What is the name Lord? Well, English Bibles translate the Hebrew name Yahweh as the Lord, which is always capitalized, or sometimes as the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. So this, in chapter 2, we get introduced to, it's the Lord, and it's the Lord that, um, that, uh, well, let me just, don't get too far ahead of myself. So the name uh, Yahweh, um, we've got an explanation in Exodus 3.14, is I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. And it really comes from a root that means the one that brings forth. So the one that calls into existence. Let there be light. Light was brought forth. And this is God the Son. This is Yahweh is God the Son, the Son of God. He's the direct representative of God and the mediator of the covenant. A mediator is someone that brings it together, brings the two parties together, brings brings the fulfillment. That's an important word. And we'll talk about that later on. But so the, the Lord um, is is introduced here as the one. And, you, and you, as you go through the chapter two, you see it's the Lord that breathes into Adam. It's the Lord that gives Adam the the instructions. It's the Lord that that uh, separates um, um, and, and makes the, the, the man and the woman and, and gives them the covenant. So, example, Genesis 2, 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for on the day that thou may eat thereof thou shalt surely die. So remember, it's the Lord's giving him this. So what what is that about? Well, in order to have a covenant, both parties have to agree. Even though there's no cost, there's no compensation, 
There has to be something to represent each party. So man's observation of the word of God was the visible sign or signal of man's acceptance of God's covenant. In observing God's word, man would never taste the presence, power, or penalty of evil. The Lord put the man into a deep sleep and then fashioned a woman out of his flesh and bones. One in nature, two in form, male and female, in the image of God, the Lord God made them. So we have this beautiful chapter that gives us more details about that sixth day, more details about the Sabbath being the celebration of what happened that sixth day, a memorial to it. A, a memorial, not because the creation was the sixth day, but they had the first day, you know, the very next day, they walked together. And what, um, it, like in the image and likeness of God. The chapter ends with, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This is the final blessing of the covenant. In cleaving to each other, in the oneness of love, they were found to be in the likeness of God. From the one he made two, and in the likeness of God, they were united. The word as one is a chap, it's, it's a Hebrew word, but when they say the Lord is one, uh, the nation of Israel is one. It's it's a special word that means a united one. It's a it's a one made from more than one part. So when it says the Lord God is one, yes, God is one, but the Lord is an individual. Um, or, or when it says God is one, the Lord is um, uh, 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 a name given to us for. Um, you know, for the mediator of this covenant. All that God covenanted was brought forth and fulfilled through the Lord. The fulfillment began day one with let there be light. In six days, the heavens and earth were created and filled with light. Upon the creation of man in the form of the woman and the man, the Lord declared his uh, creation completed. The seventh day, the Lord and his covenant people walked together without sin and in harmony. So what is the Sabbath day? It's the first holy day. Of course, holidays came from the idea of holy days. So the first holy day. It memorializes the historic seventh day when God's covenant was fulfilled through the Lord when man, in the image of likeness of God and in the absence of sin, walked together with the Lord and inherited the covenant promise of having dominion over all creation. So there was a historic first observation. That day, that seventh day, was a historic day. It actually happened. And that Sabbath was, you know, was was um, given by the Lord. But it represents something that act historic. So what, what, how are we supposed to observe it? Well, it's ongoing observance every seventh day. It's perpetual. It's ongoing. It's a covenant. It doesn't, it, the first, the next day is the first day of the next seven-day cycle. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The next day, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's perpetual. It's ongoing. It's been from generation to generation. How, what's, what's the way of observance? It's peaceful communion with each other and with God. And what's the authority? Like I said, Congress has the authority for the Declaration of Independence. The authority is God. God is the one that has the authority to initiate this day and nobody else. So uh, there was an attack on this covenant. There's an attack on the Sabbath observance. We don't know how many Sabbaths or how many years of Sabbaths were enjoyed between man and God. But it was less than 130 years because of his first, because of what we read later in Scripture. But we don't know how long it was before the woman fell into temptation and the man enjoined himself to her faith. We observe, however, that the satanic attack on God's covenant people from the beginning has been an attack on the Sabbath observance. Because if they break the covenant, then they break the, 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 the Sabbath, they no longer walk together as one, they lose their inheritance. So this very first observation is that this is this attack on the Sabbath observance. When man failed to observe the word of God, they rejected his covenant. But what we focus on here and how we know it's a covenant 
is the covenant response of the Lord that we observe. And we observe this in the very next chapter. So first of all, we talked about the serpent, etc. in there. But later in Revelation, we learn the identity of the serpent. So that great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth. Now, there's something in modern law that's called the doctrine of clean hands, which means you can't gain anything from the court in matters that you negatively influenced. And remember, Satan is called the accuser, uh, accuser of man, the accuser of God. And I'm sure when he was called together with the man and the woman, he was rubbing his hands together. He couldn't wait to get in there and accuse the man and accuse the woman because in his mind, he had set a perfect legal trap. He ensnared the man and the woman, got them to break the, the covenant, got them to reject the word of God. So in his mind, whatever was done, whatever God planned to do to Satan for, for breaking the word of God, for rebelling against the word of God, he would have to do to the man and the woman because he'd, he'd ensnared them into doing the same thing. So he thought he was he set this perfect trap. The problem is that man was guilty of swallowing the lie and failing to uphold the covenant. But Satan was guilty of conspiracy to commit fraud. He did, deceived them. Theft, he tried to steal their inheritance and murder. He wanted, the, the punishment was death. So in his cunning to create a legal trap, he failed to observe the law. He acted against man and God without a cause, which subjected himself to judgment. And that's why the very first person judged in here, because we're going to discuss this later on, but the covenant was, you know, he, he had never been part of the covenant. He'd never, uh, you know, in fact, it was pointing towards that, tree and that serpent and saying you know exclude that that's not part of the covenant don't eat from that fruit <clears throat> so the lord god said unto the serpent he begins with because thou hast done this thou art cursed a cursed in a biblical sense means condemned as evil without any further reservation so now, boom, because you've done this, just you have failed to observe all, and you're, all your cunning and all you're trying to the seat and trying to trap the man and the woman, you yourself have actually put yourself in judgment. You've actually um, failed to observe the law. And so what does uh, the Lord say? An enmity I will put, so this is personal, I'm sort of, I'm personally between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So hate is what Satan is. Hate is, is, is without a cause. Enmity is with a cause. So for example, mother grizzly bear. A mother grizzly bear will defend her cubs against a male twice her size and she'll fight to the death to defend those cubs. But it's with a cause. There's a reason why she's putting herself between the, the, the cubs because she knows that that male grizzly wants to kill those cubs. And so that's her enmity. That's that's between her, she's putting her herself between the danger and the cubs. So when the Lord says, I'll put my enmity, and my enmity I'll put. Now we see the covenant in action. The stronger is obliged to help the weaker fulfill their obligations. The Lord filled steps in the gap between Satan and the woman. He personally himself will be enmity between Satan and the woman. Also, between uh, Satan's seed and her seed, until through her seed, he will crush the head of the serpent. So the Lord will keep his light in the world through the seed of the woman, until the foretold seed, capital S, would crush the serpent's head and regain man, man's inheritance. So the covenant remained the same. It still was for man to walk in the likeness and image of God, together with God, 
in harmony. That's 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 never changed, but the conditions have changed through the lack of faith and belief in the word of God spoken through the Lord. Man had forsaken their inheritance and their eternity. Now, through faith in his word, the Lord would redeem them. But to redeem means that there's a cost. If I'm going to redeem my mortgage or redeem, but particularly if I'm going to say my son has, has taken his bike and driven into somebody's car, in a parked car or something, and there's a scratch, I, I, I can say, look, I want to redeem the actions of my son, and can I give you $50 to get this thing buffed out or, or whatever? There's always a cost to redemption. So as the Lord pronounced, as he pronounced this to Satan, as, as he spoke the words to Adam and Eve, and told them about the cost and, the, and how difficult things have become now for them, that's the first time that Adam called his wife Eve, the mother of all living. Up until then, it was the woman. The woman. This is when he first called his wife Eve, mother of all living. And what the Lord does is he, he proclaims the covenant first and waits for the appropriate response. The man's response was, after hearing all the judgment, call his wife Eve. So that means he had faith that the Lord would do what he said he'd do. She, the seed of the woman. And so because of that, the Lord made a covering for them, and he entered them again into his covenant. The first time he entered Adam into the covenant was don't eat the fruit, etc. Now this is the same covenant, because you can only enter something that already exists. I can only enter into a room that already exists, or I can enter into a war. <clears throat> so when he's entering into the covenant, the covenant has to change. It's just now it's a covenant of redemption because they have to be redeemed before that Sabbath can be regained. So Adam is made an intermediary, their intermediary, or a representative of man. And it's not a mediator. I don't know how many times I've seen where people say, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, King David were mediators of the covenant. You will not find that word anywhere in the Old Testament. You will also not find it applied to them in the New Testament. It'll say things like um, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, or you know, but it's better because of who, um, you know, because he uh, he can fulfill it. But the but it's but none of those others are mediators. Only Jesus, or only the Lord is the mediator. So, but he, but to be in a covenant, like I said before, you have to have a representation. So Adam represents man, and uh, and Adam and Eve, they're, like I said, they do the ceremony, they were covered. There was a cost involved in that ceremony to, to cover them with skins. Obviously, a life had to be taken. But but just to, to get the kind of everything down here, there's this is the same covenant, the same Sabbath that it's based on, but now it's a covenant of redemption. And as, as for example, Adam lived over 900 years, uh, you know, then Noah was born just over a thousand years, and then Abraham, so there's always, Noah was alive when Abraham was alive. So he kept a light in the world, and as the covenant was further and further fulfilled, this seed of the woman was further and further fulfilled then uh you know he was able to take others and enter them into the covenant on behalf of, of man also as intermediaries so the clearest revelation of the redemption was given to the pattern in moses and moses was given a sabbath of holy day fulfillments Passover, first fruits, etc. It's seven different um, days. Each appointed day was observed in a different appointed way. Appointed day, appointed way, all representing things of fulfillment. And the reason why I say that is because when you look at, for example, the eleven different days for the U.S., um, you know the the Declaration of, of Independence, the the the, the celebration of, of the U.S. When there was wars later on, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, they didn't change the, the July Fourth holiday to some other day when they defended that independence. They created another day, like Memorial Day, another day in observance of that. 
So each day and each way is, is separate. The Sabbath was never changed. There was given a Sabbath of years. There was given the Jubilee, seven times seven years. Fulfillment upon fulfillment. Remember, the Sabbath is always fulfillment. But the covenant and the seventh day remain unchanged. So when you're looking at different days, each day is for an appointed um, event. So, but this clear pattern was given to Moses, and that became the worship pattern for the nation of Israel. Uh, part of that uh, in giving it to Moses was the seventh day was given as a sign. Now, a sign means, um, again, acceptance. It's, it's to signify. Um, so I ask you to observe this. How do you signify that you that you agree with that, that that's what you want too, that you want that Sabbath peace that rests between man and God? Well, I observe it. I, I'm agreeing by my observation of it. If I don't agree, I, I don't observe it. Like I said before, earlier we are talking about observe days. The ones that have the most significance are the ones that are going to actually observe that. So it's a, it was a, given as a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of the testimony, tables of stone written on the finger of God. The Lord gave Moses this instruction. And what is on those tables of stone? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six day thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God. In it shall do no work, nor thy son nor daughter, thy manservant, etc. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So I want you to notice that it keeps saying the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and how it. So it's the seventh day, not a seventh day, as in keep one day out of every seven. It's not, well, let's pick the second day, and then we'll keep every seven days from there. So it'll be the second, the ninth, the eleventh, you know, whatever. It's the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath day because the Sabbath day is the day that God rested and declared holy, and this is the day given as observance. So this is, in Moses' time, this is thousands of years after the garden, and he's saying, observe the Sabbath day. It's a sign between um, you know, between me and you, and it's on written in stone on the tablets of, of the testimony, and those are the covenant uh, um, commandments. So you have, um, again, in the clearest pattern you're given, the Sabbath is, is, is foremost in it. It's, it's, there's no other holy day, even though God gave other holy days for well. There's no other holy day in the commandments but the Sabbath. And it's the Sabbath day. <clears throat> and we notice that before when it says, uh, the seed of the woman, the seed, he and his are all capitalized. The capitalization intentionally denotes his divinity. To be born of the woman establishes his, his humanity. This seed would equally be born the Son of Man and the Son of God. In this we observe that it is the same Lord that proclaimed this that would be the seed to fulfill it. As we've observed, the Lord that was chosen to bring forth the Word of God, he is the living Word of God through which creation was spoken into existence. We see earlier on, it's the Lord. Read it right there. He breathed life into Adam as the mediator um, of the covenant and to fulfill it. And what do we read of Jesus Christ? The seed of the woman. It's written, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not nothing, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. For the Lord is the Son of God. Son of God. That So the same things that is said of Jesus, we observe at the beginning with the Lord. 
Moses forsook his royalty to join his enslaved brethren to deliver them from their slave masters. After um, much further reaching, the Lord, God the Son, would forsake his royalty to enjoin himself to man to eternally deliver man from the slavery and bondage of Satan. Born from above in the nature of man, he would bear the express image and likeness of God. He would walk this earth without sin and in the covenant oneness of his love for God and for mankind. What is the Sabbath? In the image and likeness of God, without sin, walking this earth in love of God and the love of man. That's what Jesus came to fulfill. As written of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. First Colossians 15, 16. And again, it is written, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. In 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, that man Christ. So when it talks about Jesus being the mediator, the Lord was a mediator from the beginning. And it wouldn't be handed to anybody else but the seed of the, of the woman. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, angels or demons, fears for today, worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed. How is it revealed? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'll take a little drink here, sorry. And what does Jesus say? Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So we're talking about about the law, about the Sabbath, about the other days that are given. No, nothing will pass until that return, until all things are fulfilled. So have all things been fulfilled? <clears throat> For it, it says in Hebrews 3, If Joshua had given them rest, there would be not afterwards have been spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his work, own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So the rest, and this is Paul speaking, remains open. Of course, we weren't even born then, so that rest remained open for us. That rest, that the, 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 that's the final, um, you know, the, the last person in the last generation till probation closes, that rest is open to him. And so all things haven't been fulfilled. Christ fulfilled everything from the very beginning, from the foundation. When he said, I'm going to do this, it was already fulfilled. But it hasn't been delivered. And Christ, when he went to the cross, fulfilled. And he, and he fulfilled the, the, the uh, he walked and fulfilled the, 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 the law precisely. But he hasn't delivered it yet. And not because, or because, that was what was anointed. That was what was given. Even in the even in the um, Day of Atonement, you know, there's he, he the, the high priest goes in in his bloody rags and he makes a sacrifice, but he comes out in his robes of beauty and his in his royal robes. Jesus has given 
you know, through God, the time for his fulfillment of all the people that are his from Adam till today. So fulfillment of all is upon the glorious return of Christ Jesus. So nothing will to, there's nothing to pass from the law until that day. You know, what day? Till the day of Jesus' return. That nothing until it's all fulfilled. There's no um you know, nothing in the law that should be taken away from the law. But the Sabbath day is the foundation of the whole thing. So I want to talk a little bit about these seven undeniable proofs that man has no authority to change the seven days of observance. The first is it's a historic day. It memorializes a triumphant, historic, specific day in history. The seventh day, just like it says in the fourth commandment, the seventh day, the day, the day. So just as July 4th, imagine if you took July 4th, which was a real historic day, and he said, okay, we're going to change the observance of it to May 13th. Well, well, what significance does it have anymore then? Because the Congress passed it on July 4th. It would have no significance. Why would you change something and still have any significance if it's a historic day? And this is a historic day. So so there's no... And who... So, so number two is... It's a covenant. It's not a contract. So a covenant means perpetual. It's like, like I said, in a marriage, it's till death do you part. You know, in a land covenant, it goes from generation to generation. It's perpetual. It's ongoing. It's from fulfillment to fulfillment to fulfillment. So well, at what point would you decide that, okay, it's been fulfilled. We're not going to do it anymore. It's, it's a covenant. It's from God. So there's no, there's no, and it, it, there's no authority and no reason that that would change. Third is the authority. You know, like I said Congress is the one that appoints uh, holidays in the U.S. God appoints holy days, and God never said anywhere else, <clears throat> "I'm changing the Sabbath day." You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. The Sabbath day is the whole covenant. It's what Jesus came to fulfill. It came to, and that's the next point, but it's a fulfillment. It's not a, um, it's, 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 it was fulfilled already on that seventh day, and it will be fulfilled again through the Lord. So, like I said, other days and ways were given for that redemption plan, Passover, first fruits. In fact, here's something interesting. Passover was the 14th day. Then you have the Sabbath, and then you have first fruits on the, on the, the Sunday. So people say, well, the Sabbath was changed to the first day of the week, the Sunday, because that's when the Lord rose. Well, guess what? They already had a day named after it. It's called first fruits. <laughs> there was already a holy day set aside for that very event that Jesus fulfilled. Also, Passover the 14th day. The next day is the Sabbath. Where was Jesus on that next day? He was resting in the tomb. He was supposed to rest in his works, rest in, in him. And Jesus was resting in the tomb on the Sabbath day between the Passover and the first fruits. So what what when you say, well, we're, we're, we're going to observe it this day? Because, well, it's, like I said, in in when you have different events happen to help defend America's freedom, uh, whether it's Martin Luther King Day to civil rights, whether it's Memorial Day for the, they're they're given different days and different ways of observation, and they're and they're significant to that event, to Martin Luther's birthday, or to um, you know to Memorial Day for whatever the day is. So the Sabbath day, there's no justification. It's a fulfillment. And the Sabbath day is the is the, the signature of the whole covenant. It's the sign of the covenant, number five. Its observance signifies our acceptance. It's never been taken away. It's we observe the Sabbath today 
by saying, okay, this is the day that the Lord has said, uh, you know, this is our day together. And so if I choose to observe that day, I'm signifying to God who sanctifies me that, yes, I accept that the covenant. I want that. I want to be with you. I want to, I want you to be victorious. I want you to get rid of sin and deliver, deliver me. So why would I suddenly have a different day for me and a different day for Adam and Eve? And, a, you know, it, it, it makes no sense. It's, it's always been the Sabbath. It's for a specific thing, and, and it's given to us so that we can accept the, the covenant. I mean, we're given baptism as well, but the, that's, that's being baptized into his death and resurrection. The, the, the Sabbath is given to be a, a day between God and man, a certain way to observe it, and it's never changed. Second of all, or number six, it's the seventh day, not a seventh day as far as it's a commandment. It's actually a commandment. And last, it awaits its full fulfillment with glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's not one dot, one tittle can be taken from that until the return of the Lord. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy or to take away anything from the law. I came to fulfill the law. Fulfill the Sabbath day, fulfill Passover, fulfill first fruits, fulfill. But all those feast days have not yet been fulfilled either because the Lord has not returned. So have we fulfilled the, the Day of Atonement or the uh, tabernacle or something? I mean, those are theological questions. But in reality, until we see the that's when we know everything is fulfilled. That's the day that we pray for and wait for. So we have these days that we can choose to observe because God gave them as holy days and our observance is based on what we think is significant. If we don't think it's significant, that, that the Passover, we don't think first roots, we don't think Pentecost, we don't think, then we don't have to observe it. But if we think it's significant, then we observe it. And, and no one can judge you on that. So this um, uh, you know, first part, I want to show that there really is, and, and people can say what they want to, her, but when you really get down to it, there, there's, there's absolutely zero justification that man has any authority to change the Sabbath day or any reason to change the Sabbath day. And if it does, it's the only observed day you'll find in the entire world that can be changed like that. Or that would be changed like that. You know, we don't decide next year that um, Martin Luther King Day is going to be in July and this day is going to be some other day. Once it's set, it's set. And it goes on. It continues. Like I said, they start off with four days in the U.S. 250 years ago. And now there's 11. You know, so it's, but it's, it's um, four different events that have happened in history since then. They're all historic events. The Sabbath is a historic day, and it is a celebration of the covenant being fulfilled. It's a fulfillment that God, all of creation, from let there be light to man and walking that historic day, when that was witnessed, that was the fulfillment of God's covenant. God walked with his covenant people. The Lord walked with his covenant people that day. And we don't know how many days after that. But we know that um, there was no sin, and they walked together exactly as God had promised. And so, and when when that Sabbath day got attacked, when that observance got attacked, Jesus didn't, the, the Lord didn't terminate the contract. He doubled down, and he put himself in entity, put himself between the woman and, and Satan, himself between um, the seed, and put himself as the seed to fulfill this covenant. So this was Genesis 3.15 when that was given. The whole rest of the Bible, that's the third chapter of the first book. There's 66 books. So the whole rest of the Bible is about the fulfillment of that covenant. Like I said, the old covenant, new covenant. 
but in Genesis 3.15 is also the first biblical prophecy. It's, it's Genesis, the origin, the beginning of what I call the covenant code. We've done, uh, I've done two different series on the covenant code, but just to give an example, or a better explanation of, of a covenant code, a code is three different things. It can, it can be three different things. It can be a governing code. So, um, and, and it is, it's the conduct of the Lord in response to the attempt to destroy his covenant relationship with man. So there's, there's a governing code. There's a law that, that comes out of that. There's a covenant standard. Um, so for example, you can have a dress code, you know, um, is, is part of a covenant standard. So the standard required to remain or enter the covenant, and that is, it's faith in the Lord and his word and his righteousness. It's his righteousness that were cloven. So the covenant, can, uh, a code can be a governing code. It can be a covenant uh, or a st standard. But mostly, and this is exactly what it is here as well, it's the messaging. Beginning at Genesis 3.15, the words, symbols, other forms of communication from God that we are, are intended to be received and understood by his people regarding the observation of the prophetic fulfillment of his covenant, specifically regarding the seed of the woman. So God put in all of those scriptures, and we've studied some of them out, what we're intended to see, what every word counts, everything matters. It's the language of God. He teaches us a new language that's not confusing, and he explains it to us and puts things in there so that we recognize his word. So I'm just looking at my time here, 